Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome uh, to the State Department. Welcome to Washington, D.C. Uh, welcome to the Ben Franklin Room and to this pledging conference in support of Iraq. And we are very, very appreciative. Uh, in complicated times and times when everybody's budget faces many different pressures, uh, we're really grateful that so many countries have come together with such a sense of purpose uh, in order to meet the urgent uh, demands of a country that is under siege, but making progress, a country that is fighting for its uh, future uh, and specifically fighting against the most nihilistic, uh, empty ideology that any of us have witnessed in our lifetimes. Uh, against which I think we have summoned a rather remarkable level of support uh, in an effort to win back Iraq's freedom and to end the scourge of this terrorism. So this is a cause that truly deserves a firm uh, and generous commitment from everybody. And I want to express a special appreciation to the co-hosts uh, of this event, Stefan Dion and Canada, who are here, uh, Frank Walter Steinmeier, uh, who uh, represents Germany, Japan, Mr. Kotin, uh, Kuwait, uh, the minister, were, uh, I think, on which side of me here? Right here, yes, thank you, my friend. And also the Netherlands. Uh, Bert Kunders is here representing the Netherlands. And to all the governments here represented today, uh, a profound thank you. And each of you will have an opportunity to speak and articulate why you're here and why you see this as important. Uh, Foreign Minister uh, Joffrey of Iraq, we're deeply grateful to you for being here. We appreciate your leadership. Uh, and I especially want to thank the woman to my right, our permanent representative to the United Nations, Ambassador Samantha Power, who has been really a powerful and important voice of conscience with respect to the issue of refugees, displaced people, uh, the laws of warfare, and all of the issues which unite us here uh, today. Uh, I likewise want to thank the distinguished representatives who are here from the United Nations, from the World Bank, and other major international institutions. So my friends, there is not a single region in the world today that hasn't at one time or another in the last 20 years been scarred by conflict. And we have learned that periods of sustained violence uh, can leave behind wounds that if neglected, they simply set the stage for future strife. So we're here today because we share a concern about exactly that phenomenon and its potential in Iraq. In the past two years, countries from across the globe have come together to help Iraq respond to the threat that's posed by Daesh and to reclaim occupied territory and to assist in caring for the survivors of genocide, brutal torment, and slavery. And obviously we have to draw a careful line between uh, articulating the progress we are making, because we are making progress, uh, with significant portions of Iraq reclaimed, significant portions of Syria now beginning to be reclaimed, and large numbers of Daesh leadership taken off the field of battle completely. But nevertheless, we can't minimize the danger that Daesh continues to present. Uh, and the challenge that we must continue to face. The fight against Daesh is obviously far from finished, even as we have progress. Mosul is not yet free. Uh, acts of terrorism remain a constant daily danger. But the momentum, there is nobody at this table who would argue that the momentum hasn't shifted. It has shifted. And Daesh has been driven out of almost half the territory that once occupied in Iraq. Tikrit has been liberated. 100,000 people went back to Tikrit to repopulate. Ramadi, 
liberated, people going back to Ramadi, Fallujah most recently liberated, people going back. But there are extraordinary dangers in that going back because refrigerators, closets, beds, uh, you know, rooms have been left with IEDs. And a significant number of people in the hundreds, multiple hundreds, have lost their lives simply in the act of trying to go back into their home. So demining, undoing IEDs, beginning to make these communities safe is critical. Now, that's the new challenge that we face, is securing and aiding in the recovery of a liberated area. So a pledging conference, I want to remind everybody, is not something that we do instead of the contributions that we routinely make to international programs. What we are doing here today is something that we do in addition to our regular budgets. And it's a step that we take in response to extraordinary circumstances. Those, those are what we see today, extraordinary circumstances in Iraq. So our goal at this session is to raise at least $2 billion in new money to invest in four specific areas. These include humanitarian aid, direct aid to alleviate crisis immediately, demining assistance, immediate help for communities recently freed from Daesh, and the fourth category is the funding facility for expanded stabilization that will be described in greater detail over lunch. And this new facility is something that was recently conceived and only recently begun to be put together aimed at aiding Iraq's recovery program over the longer term, not just the short term. So it's in our interest to make these urgently required investments because every one of us here knows that what happens in Iraq uh, has an impact on all of our countries. That's the world we live in today. For better or worse, everything we do in Iraq has the opportunity to help make our security better. It's in our interest to give tangible support to an Iraqi government that is pursuing much needed reforms. And I had a moment to talk with uh, uh, the foreign minister, uh, Jaffrey, who will talk with all of us about those uh, commitments uh, as we go forward. We're working to build more inclusive institutions. We're working to help instill hope among Iraqi citizens writ large. And all of these measures are critical because ultimately everybody here understands the future of Iraq is going to be determined by Iraqis, uh, not by us. So this is what we mean when we say that Daesh cannot be defeated by military means alone. To eliminate Daesh from Iraq permanently, the government in Baghdad has got to be viewed as responsive to the needs of the people. In all parts of the country, regardless of tribe, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of creed. So an important way to demonstrate that we are making that possible is for citizens displaced from areas that were previously occupied by Daesh to be able to return to their homes safely and to receive the services that they need to be able to build their communities, resume their lives, and pass on to their children a safer place. So we're focused today very simply on helping the government make the progress towards precisely those goals. Again, I thank everybody for coming here. We're going to try and run through this very sharply. Uh, and uh, later I'll make uh, mention about our own pledge. But first, we have an opportunity to hear from Yunami uh, and uh, from uh, Jan Kubish, our friend who is uh, dedicated to uh, working as the special representative for the UN Secretary General in trying to uh, make these things happen. So, Jan, if you would brief us all, we would appreciate it very, very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary Kerry, uh, uh, Your Excellency Minister Jafari, uh, Excellencies, uh, Ministers, uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, uh, allow me to express our UN gratitude, but I believe that. Uh, 
we speak uh, also on behalf of uh, all Iraqis. Uh, to you, Secretary Kerry, to the United States, uh, to be such a staunch supporter of uh, uh, the, uh, not only fight against Daesh, but all of the efforts to stabilize the situation in the country and to create openings for more stable, peaceful uh, future of the country. This conference is a very clear manifestation uh, of your uh, uh, long-term determined support. And uh, also I would like to thank uh, uh, all uh, the co-hosts uh, uh, of this very important conference, uh, as well as uh, all of you that, that came here with a clear mission, with a clear message. We are here uh, to support uh, Iraq, to support the government of Iraq, to support the people of Iraq. Uh, uh, the people of Iraq are fighting uh, also on our behalf, uh, uh, the Daesh, uh, this uh, uh, bandit terrorist organization, and uh, they deserve the support. Secondly, this is a very timely conference. Secretary, you mentioned uh, the momentum that has shifted. But to solidify this momentum, to move it forward, to indeed uh, shape the future of post-Daesh Iraq, this pledging conference is uh, slated to play a very important role. This is a conference about the future of Iraq. This is not only about the concrete, imminent, very important humanitarian needs, needs of reconstruction and rehabilitation. This conference has all the prerequisite to shape the future, provided successful, and I have no doubt, looking around the table, that this conference will be a successful one. Uh, the recent strategic victories against ISIL in Fallujah and Kayara have once again proved that with support of the international community, Iraqis are capable of defeating Daesh. Progress against Daesh has now put liberation of Mosul strongly on the agenda. As preparations continue with increased focus and acceleration for the United Nations, the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Abadi, has prioritized UN-supported humanitarian stabilization, demining, and reconstruction and rehabilitation activities and operations, and has requested the international community to urgently provide the necessary financing. Together with planning the military aspects, the government and the local actors also need to accelerate political planning for the day after the liberation addressing the issues of administrative governance, law and order, and political management of Mosul and the rest of Nineveh after liberation. I note the increased coordination between Baghdad and Erbil and encourage continued efforts to this end. And also, any international assistance must be fully coordinated with the government of Iraq and must respect the principle of sovereignty of Iraq. Victories over Daesh by increasingly unified efforts of all Iraqi people, all its components, have created a positive environment for prioritizing also reconciliation that now becomes a matter of considerable urgency. Only inclusive national reconciliation can ensure that the post-Daesh phase in Iraq's history will be more stable, secure, and prosperous. For the military operation against Daesh to be successful, the military operations need to be accompanied by adequate protection to an assistance, the protection of and assistance to civilians. IDPs, now also those that, who took the decision to leave Fallujah, although many predicted that they would continue supporting Daesh. Providing shelter and protection to them could embolden the people in Mosul to follow the example of their compatriots in Fallujah. The world must recognize that Iraq requires more, not less, international support at this critical juncture. This conference is indeed a sign of the international community's continued commitment to a stable, unified, and peaceful Iraq and its recognition of the sacrifices Iraq and its people bear in fighting terrorist Daesh. Uh, with your permission, I would like to ask my deputy, the humanitarian coordinator, and the representative, the head of the whole UN family in, uh, uh, in Iraq, uh, uh, Madame Lise Grande, uh, to uh, give a more detailed presentation about the needs and requirements uh, 
of Iraq and its people at this point of time. Thank you very much. Mr. Secretary of State, Mr. Foreign Minister from Iraq, we're delighted to be with you today. The first point we would like to make, as Dr. Kubish has already said, is that we are incredibly, enduringly grateful to the U.S. government and to the Canadian, Japanese, German, Dutch, and Kuwaiti governments for convening this donor conference. We are grateful to the government of Iraq for its leadership. And we acknowledge with admiration the sacrifices the Iraqi people are making to degrade and defeat ISIL. Please know that we are grateful to all of the donors who have shown confidence in the work of humanitarian partners in Iraq and in the work of the United Nations Development Program as the manager of the funding facility for stabilization. Nothing we do in the field would be possible without the support. On behalf of the humanitarian community in Iraq, we hope you will allow us the following gentle observations. ISIL is being defeated militarily. This is indisputable and it is crucially important. But as every humanitarian knows, every victory on the battlefield creates an immediate humanitarian crisis. The impact on the future of Iraq of the humanitarian crisis cannot be underestimated. 10 million Iraqis need humanitarian aid right now. By the end of the year, 13 million are likely to be in trouble. 90% of all of the people who have been displaced from their homes since the rise of ISIL are Sunnis. Families who have been forced to flee because of the conflict have been dispossessed of everything they own. Most feel humiliated and many have no choice but to live in camps and transit centers unless something is done to help the people who have been impacted by the conflict and to give Iraqis a stake in the future of their country, we have to be prepared for the fact that hundreds of young men may be radicalized into extremism and hundreds of thousands of discouraged families may feel they have no choice but to migrate to Europe. The civilians that humanitarians are helping represent the core and backbone of the country. Without their support, there will be no reconciliation in Iraq and no peace. The military campaign will have achieved a great short-term success, but perhaps little else of enduring impact. This is why humanitarians feel that to avoid this, the investments being made in Iraq need to be rebalanced urgently to ensure that the people who have lost everything during the conflict receive the help they need and deserve. In the months ahead, things are going to be very difficult. We expect that hundreds of thousands of Iraqis are going to be newly displaced. In the Ambar Corridor alone, an estimated 230,000 people will be displaced in coming weeks. Along the Mosul Corridor, in the lead up to Mosul itself, Mass displacement is already occurring. We expect that as many as 660,000 additional civilians are likely to flee from their homes. And then there is Mosul itself. The Mosul humanitarian operation will be the largest, most complex in the world in 2016. As many as 1.2 to 1.5 million civilians are likely to be impacted. During the past several months, humanitarian partners have been working on a contingency plan for Mosul. Our expectation is that the Mosul operation will be conducted along four axes. Each will have different coordination, operational response, and protection modalities. Along the first axis, people in Mosul on the east bank of the river are expected to flee toward the Nineveh Plains. The number of people who will do so is going to depend on bridge aspect. The bridge access. Along the second axis, people in Mosul from both sides of the river are expected to flee towards the border. Given the sensitivity of the border, security forces will be closely monitoring movements and may not allow some families to cross. Along the third axis, people on the west bank of the river in Mosul are expected to flee, some of them, towards Tel Afar. The civilians who do so will be at extreme risk possibly trapped between fighting forces. The areas where these civilians are fleeing are remote. There are few partners and almost no services. Along the fourth axis, people on the west bank of the river are expected to flee southwards to Kiara, the Mokmur Corridor, and to Tikrit. 
Conditions are going to be very tough on this access. Most families will be transported hundreds of kilometers to Tikrit, although limited facilities in places like Kiara and other areas may be available. There are few humanitarian partners and very few services along the way. As they have done throughout the crisis, religious endowments and zakat committees are expected to play a major role during this part of the humanitarian operation. The nature of the battle for Mosul will determine the scale and length of displacement, and it will determine the cost of the operation for Mosul itself. If there is limited destruction during the military campaign, and only a few people are displaced for only a few months, the cost of the operation could be around $140 million. But in a worst case scenario, if there are high levels of destruction, if more than one million people are displaced, and if they stay displaced for more than a year, the humanitarian operation is likely to cost a staggering $1.8 billion. Humanitarian partners are doing everything they can to help the millions of people in Iraq who need assistance, but we can't do much more without funding. Funding is required for three things. First, it is required for the humanitarian response plan, what we call the backbone of the operation. The appeal that was launched by humanitarian partners for 2016 asks for $860 million to support 7.3 million Iraqis. Iraqis who are already in trouble. Only 40% of this plan has been received to date. Because of that, 99 life-saving programs, including health centers on the front lines, have already been forced to shut, and hundreds more will be shut in the months ahead unless funding is received. Funding is also required to prepare for Mosul. The truth is that right now, no preparations have been made. Not a single humanitarian agency or partner has the funding it requires to do what is necessary. A, million, a minimum of $284 million is needed, needed right now to prepare. Today, the United Nations is issuing an urgent flash appeal for this amount. Arguably, nothing is more important in humanitarian terms than securing this support. And we can't forget that on top of these urgent requirements, funding, perhaps a lot of funding, is going to be needed for the people who are impacted in Mosul itself. I'd like to shift gears now and turn briefly to stabilization in newly liberated areas. The news here is very positive. 750,000 displaced Iraqis have already returned to their homes, and millions more are planning to do so in the future. We need to be frank that conditions in most liberated areas, however, are difficult. Houses and public buildings are damaged or destroyed, businesses are closed, services are minimal, and many families are worried about insecurity and possible retaliation. UNDP's Funding Facility for Immediate Stabilization, which was established a year ago, is designed to help rapidly stabilize newly liberated areas. FFIS, FIS, is operational in 14 newly liberated areas right now and will be in three more as soon as they are liberated. The aim of FIS is to give people confidence that progress is being made in newly liberated cities and districts. The approach is swift. Within days of a city being declared safe, FIS teams are there, conducting damage assessments and agreeing priorities with local authorities. Using fast-track procedures, FIS puts multiple contractors on the ground in record time doing multiple tasks. FIS is a tightly scoped instrument focused on doing the most important things first. Priority is given to repairing essential infrastructure, employing hundreds of youth on work brigades to remove rubble, providing cash grants to businesses so they can reopen, and rehabilitating schools, health centers, and pharmacies. FIS was ground tested in Tikrit. Weeks after being green-lighted, FIS teams were rehabilitating the main water pumping station, they were opening health centers, and reestablishing the electricity grid. 
Hundreds of young men and women were put to work on work brigades, cleaning the city and upgrading facilities. The University of Tikrit and the Central Police Station were reopened in record time, and more than 100 small businesses received cash grants to start operating. Three months after the start of FFIS projects, 90 percent of Tikrit families had returned to the homes and begun to rebuild their lives. The total cost of this engagement for all of that in Tikrit was eight point three million dollars. In April this year, the government and UNDP opened a second stabilization channel known as the Funding Facility for Expanded Stabilization. This second channel is similar to the first immediate channel and it is envisioned as operating sequentially, with immediate stabilization coming first and expanded stabilization coming second. FFES, the new channel, is an immediate mechanism that fast-tracks implementation of a selected range of medium-sized, high-impact, low-cost, visible projects in liberated areas. Rather than risking setbacks due to the slow pace of reconstruction in some of the country's most sensitive cities and districts, FF ES projects focus on generating large numbers of jobs in newly liberated areas and stabilizing the corridors between liberated cities. FES prioritizes the areas where families have started to leave. Families have gone home, they're discouraged, and they start to leave. That's where this new channel engages. FFES, and this is an important point, will be coordinating closely with reconstruction partners to ensure that the funding which is mobilized through this accelerated channel does not crowd out or substitute for longer term efforts. Everything that FFIS, the immediate stabilization facility, and FFES, the expanded facility, aim to achieve, however, depends on clearing liberated areas of explosive hazards. The level of explosive hazard contamination in Iraq is one of the worst in the world. Because the problem is so large and national capacity so limited, partners are adopting a blended approach using commercial companies and NGOs to undertake threat impact assessments, technical surveys, and clearance work. As soon as combat operations are concluded and a liberated area is declared safe, the United Nations Mine Action Service deploys assessment teams, followed by specialized survey and clearance teams. This highly effective, sequenced approach is being field tested in Ramadi, Garma, and Fallujah, and will be used in newly liberated towns along both the Ambar and Mosul corridors and in Mosul itself. The biggest stumbling block to rapid stabilization is IED contamination. That's why funding is urgently needed to deal with these threats. A conservative estimate is that the UN's Mine Action Service requires $112 million this year and up to $300 million over the next two years. In conclusion, we want all of our donor partners to know that every agency and partner working in Iraq on humanitarian issues, on stabilization, and to clear explosive hazards is committed to doing our very best to help improve conditions and stabilize newly liberated areas. We promise that the funding we will receive today will be immediately put to use doing the things that need to be done first. We are grateful to everyone for their generosity and their support. Thank you. Lise and uh, Jan, thank you both for giving us all such a clear and compelling sense of uh, why the money is important and where the money is going to go. And I think everybody feels the urgency from your comments. So I think the, the, the detail and the uh, passion uh, of your arguments are very, very important. My privilege now to recognize the distinguished uh, ambassador of the United Nations, Samantha Power. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Let me join you in thanking everyone who has come all this way to be here. And more importantly, thank you for the pledges your countries have made to support this critically important time in Iraq, a pivotal time. Uh, let me also give a shout out to our special envoy, Brett McGurk, who leads our government's anti-ISIL efforts uh, brilliantly. And Liz and Jan, uh, thank you very much for the specifics and the rigor of your presentation. I think that level of detail uh, around the Mosul operation is a very significant contribution to our thinking operationally about our ne next steps uh, collectively. So thank you for that. As we all know, uh, Iraqi security forces 
with the support of the Global Coalition to Counter ISIL, are making significant headway. Uh, that, as Deputy Special Representative Gran just set out, is placing an enormous strain uh, on the UN agencies and humanitarian organizations that were already stretched thin uh, before such headway was made. According to the Red Cross, in 2015, Iraq experienced the highest number and fastest rate of displaced people in the world, which, as we all know, uh, given competing crises, is saying something. Approximately one in 10 people in the country is displaced, and at least 10 million people in Iraq need humanitarian assistance, as Lee said, possibly up to 13 million uh, by the end of the year. Uh, the fighting and insecurity in many parts of the country are making it harder to reach the people in the greatest need. Now, Iraqi security forces are, as we've heard, preparing to retake Mosul, whose population far outnumbers any other city liberated up to this point. Up to 1.5 million people could be displaced as a result of the retaking of Mosul. With the Mosul operation on the horizon then, I think for us here today, it is worth asking what we can learn from the previous instances in which ISIL has been dislodged from territory. Experience has taught us that in the immediate term, we must prepare for the rapid displacement of civilians from ISIL-controlled territories. As the fight for Fallujah escalated, for example, relief agencies and organizations were overwhelmed by the tens of thousands of residents who fled in just a very short few weeks. Many of those people endured tremendous hardship to escape the city, often walking barefoot across the desert for days, carrying small children while evading ISIL snipers and IEDs, only then to arrive at camps that were unable to meet their urgent needs. Some of the displaced were forced to sleep out in the open for days because there was not enough tents to house them. One, one uh, person, who, a woman who told a journalist on arriving at, at the camp, we ran away from Daesh, from the bombing, from the hunger, and we find this. Relief workers in Iraq's camps are doing heroic, life-saving work to make the most out of the resources they have, but it has not been nearly enough. The stretch is too great. The resources are spread too thin. The operation in Fallujah also underscored the importance of ensuring that the rights of people fleeing ISIL-controlled territory are respected. We know that ISIL fighters might try to escape encirclement by trying to mix in with fleeing civilians, so it is important that the Iraqi government develop thorough and effective procedures to screen for terrorists. But these processes must be fair and transparent, and those who violate them and commit abuses must be held accountable or the entire effort is undermined. All of this screening and rigor needs to be organized in advance of an offensive or it risks being too late. We must also help Iraqi authorities take steps to make the cities and towns liberated from ISIL safe for residents to return, which is what the overwhelming majority of displaced Iraqis want most to do, to go home. The violence and instability sowed by ISIL persists long after its fighters are driven away from the thousands of bombs and booby traps they leave behind, which have killed or maimed more than 200 people in Ramadi alone, to the infrastructure such as electric grids and bridges that ISIL destroys before abandoning cities, to the livelihoods they wipe out by ransacking stores and factories. Beneath the surface, ISIL's impact, of course, is also felt in the climate of fear, mistrust, and hostility fostered among tribes, sects, and ethnic groups that used to live together as neighbors. Yet while the cost of addressing these complex challenges is great, the cost of failing to lay an adequate foundation for security and for reconciliation is much, much greater. UN agencies, the Iraqi government, and most importantly, the Iraqi people have demonstrated the ability and determination to overcome these challenges. Such progress cannot be sustained without more support, however, and that is why the commitments being made here today are so important. I have three requests to the government's announcing pledges at this conference, including to my own. First, commitments made today must be met promptly and in full. In one recent humanitarian campaign after another, we have seen multiple donors overpromise and underdeliver. We can't let that happen here. We know the devastating human consequences that await if Iraq's military campaign outpaces its humanitarian and stabilization campaign. Second, we all must do more to rally other governments to join this effort. 
Given the regional and even global ramifications of an unstable Iraq, countries around the world have a stake in the emergence of a stable, inclusive Iraqi government. Yet too few countries are doing their fair share to help. Going into today's conference, only around 30 countries had reported contributions to the UN's 2016 funding appeal for Iraq, 30 out of 193 UN member states. Third, while it may seem impolitic to say at a conference where governments are announcing new commitments, all of us, including the United States, must already prepare to do more. At present, the 2016 Humanitarian Response Plan for Iraq is only 40 percent funded. And to be clear, that does not even take into account the flash appeal that the UN announced today of $284 million for the initial phase of the liberation of Mosul. So these are big numbers. When we discuss humanitarian campaigns like this one, we repeat the numbers so often that we can feel numb. They can start to feel abstract and their impact intangible. So we have to remind ourselves constantly that funding gaps of hundreds of millions of dollars mean that children will not be vaccinated, displaced families will be forced to sleep without a roof over their heads, and kids will not be able to study in schools that cannot be rebuilt. And the failure to provide for these fundamental human needs, as has been said, won't only hurt Iraqis, it'll hurt all our countries. ISIL and other violent extremist groups seize upon the frustrations people feel when they cannot live with dignity and when corrupt governments steal from them or favor one religious, ethnic, or political group at the expense of another. It is the conditions like those that helped ISIL gain a foothold in Iraq in the first place and such conditions could make it possible for ISIL or another group like it to regain those footholds. Let me conclude. When ISIL moved into Tikrit in 2014, they broadcast their atrocities to the world, massacring nearly 1,700 Iraqi soldiers and posting the massacre on YouTube. They also drove nearly all the city's residents from their homes, including the more than 20,000 students in Tikrit University, which ISIL then converted into its headquarters. When ISIL was driven out of Tikrit in the spring of 2015, the UN worked with Iraqi authorities to employ more than 120 at-risk youth who had recently returned to help repair the university. The colleges of law, literature, political science, and education were all restored, as was a women's dorm and the university library. Under ISIL, the idea that women would even study at university, much less live there, or that students would be allowed to read anything they wanted from that library would have been unthinkable. Yet today, not that long later, more than 16,000 university students have returned to Tikrit. 16,000. They are not the only ones. 95% of Tikrit's population, some 170,000 people, have come back to the city. And with the help of funds like the ones pledged today, Tikrit's electricity grid has been fully rebuilt and the city's residents have better access to clean water than they did before ISIL's occupation. One woman told a reporter shortly after returning to the city, I never believed I would go back home. I'm so happy and I cannot describe my feelings. Can you imagine a more powerful rejection of ISIL? Many more communities in Iraq await this future if only we are ready to help them build it. I thank you. Samantha, thank you very, very much. I think between Samantha and Lise and Jan, uh, we have a very compelling picture of the nexus between the money and the mission, uh, and we obviously all feel the urgency here. Um, it also, I think, underscores in all of us why we have to end the war itself. Uh, and, and I think it's more compelling than ever uh, when we see the collateral inspirational events that happen. In, when I say inspirational, I mean, it's not inspirational, but there's a connection to the narrative that somehow inculcates in some people's minds the notion that they're better off dead and making other people dead with them. Uh, and so whether it's Nice or Orlando or Paris or Brussels, wherever it is, we got to end this as fast as we can, and I think everybody here understands that. So there's a nexus, because part of ending it is making sure that people buy into the alternative, and that's what we're here to do. So without further ado, 
Uh, it's my privilege to begin the process now of the pledging. Uh, and uh, we're going to begin with uh, the co-hosts, and, and particularly with uh, Foreign Minister Stefan Dion of uh, uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs for Canada. So, Stefan, thank you for your country's generosity, and we look forward to your comments. Thank you. I might add to the press, those of you tuning in, keep the tally as you go along, because I think you're going to be impressed. Thank you, John. Secretary Kerry, Minister Steinmeier, Minister Minister Sconders, Minister al Shafari, distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, John, you just spoke about a uh, compelling picture, so I think you're right. The speakers before me gave us a compelling picture. And on behalf of the Government of Canada and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, and as co-host of this important event, uh, I want to explain why it was important for Canada to be here today in support of Iraq. Canada recognizes that Iraq remains at the forefront of the fight against Daesh. For this, the country of Iraq and its people have paid a debilitating price. Millions of Iraqis have been displaced, as we have heard. Millions more are in need of assistance. And, and John, what you said about uh, the refrigerators and when people, after all these things, come at home and want to feel sweet home, and it's not a sweet home at all. It's still a danger for their life. It's, it's something that we need to understand. Millions more are in need of assistance, and whole cities, communities, and families have been devastated. The appalling acts of violence perpetrated by Daesh are an outrage. This is a confrontation that the world cannot and will not turn its back on, because if we do so, it's not only Iraq, but the world stability that would be at risk. Over the past few months, We've seen encouraging progress in the fight against Daesh. Indeed, we have just heard that, in large part thanks to the sustained efforts of the Iraqi government, Iraqi forces, and coalition partners and allies. More than 743,000 displaced Iraqis have now been able to return to their homes. However, success on the battlefield is only part of the solution. We also have a responsibility to assist vulnerable civilians who have been caught in the crossfire. Repatriation to liberated areas, such as Ramadi, has been severely hampered by the degree of IED and unexploded on, on, on ordnance contamination, and as well as the challenges in reestablishing basic services to meet the population's need. Stabilization and humanitarian needs remain great. Reports from the UN, the ICRC, and other humanitarian organizations in places such as Fallujah and worrisome are worrisome. And the anticipated campaign to liberate Mosul can be expected to exacerbate the situation on the ground. ISIL's abuses targeting Yazidis amounts to genocide according to the UN Mandated Commission of Inquiries June 2016 report. I have written to the UN Secretary General twice in this regard, and Canada, with the support of the government of Iraq, continues to call on the UN Security Council to take urgent action against this genocide. The international community acknowledges the significant pressures that are being placed on the people and the institutions of Iraq. We are here today to pledge additional support for Iraq so it can mitigate the, burdens of it, uh, the burden it is bearing. It is vital that Iraq's social fabric, economy, and infrastructure receive the assistance they need to enable them to withstand the mounting strengths. Canada is fully committed to supporting the Iraqi people. That is, that is why I am announcing $158 million Canadian dollars for much-needed humanitarian and stabilization efforts in Iraq. On that amount, $150 million will be provided to meet the basic needs of Iraqis 
whose lives have been torn apart by conflict. In order to provide funding predictability, our support will be provided over three years, thereby ensuring greater effectiveness and impact. Working through multilateral organizations, non-governmental organizations, and the Red Cross Red Crescent movement, our assistance will include urgent life saving support for health services, water, shelter, protection, and food. Canada is also supporting host governments and communities to deliver vital services, rebuild infrastructure, and create jobs. To help set the conditions on the ground for people to return to their homes in areas liberated from Daesh, Canada will also provide $8 million in stabilization assistance. This includes $4 million to support efforts by the funding facility for immediate stabilization and $4 million to a U.S.-led initiative to clean IEDs in Ramadi and other liberated areas. These contributions will help to quickly reestablish access to essential services and key public infrastructure to meet the needs of affected populations while at the same time reducing the impact of IEDs have on both returnees and ongoing stabilization efforts. This assistance is part of Canada's strategy to address the crisis in the Middle East region announced by Prime Minister Trudeau in February 2016. Through this $1.6 billion three-year strategy, Canada is committed to providing significant humanitarian development, security, and stabilization assistance as part of an in integrated and sustained response to this crisis. We do this for the people of Iraq and also for international stability. Canada is also working with international partners to support Iraq's economic reform efforts and will provide up to $200 million in additional financing support to the government of Iraq, including through a guarantee contribution to the World Bank to help increase its lending to Iraq. Canada is proud to provide vital support to the people of Iraq that will help them meet their most pressing humanitarian needs as they take important steps towards reclaiming and rebuilding their fractured communities. Canadians will stand with Iraqis as they work to ensure a more prosperous and peaceful future for themselves and future generations. We look forward to hearing how others will be joining us in providing support to Iraq. John, thank you for this initiative. Merci beaucoup pour cette initiative et ce leadership. Le Canada est présent. Thank you very much for this initiative. Canada is back. Thank you. Well, we welcome that. We welcome you back. And uh, Stefan, thank you for kicking us off with a strong statement and, and most importantly, a very important pledge. We appreciate it. Now my pleasure to introduce Frank Walter Steinmeier, the federal foreign minister. Germany. Thank you, John, for your kind invitation to Washington after Brussels on Monday, London on Tuesday. We are meeting for the third time this week, but important enough that and we, meet we, again, are, we meet again tomorrow. <laughs> and again tomorrow. But important enough that we are meeting for this indeed important pledging conference and support of Iraq. As one of the co-chairs, I'm very pleased to see so many partners in the room today ready to support Iraq in this time of need. And dear Iraqi colleague Al Jafari, let me extend a particular welcome to you and your delegation. I would like to take this opportunity to underline Germany's support at a time where once more Iraq is being hit by a cascade of heinous terrorist attacks. I would like to join everyone around the table in expressing our heartfelt condolences and assuring the Iraqi people of our continued support. Today, let me commend the Iraqi people and the government for their enduring strength and dedication in fighting ISIL, rebuilding the liberated areas, and ensuring a safe IDP return. Together, we have made undeniable progress in Iraq. Ramadi, Tikrit, Fallujah, and other places are all evidence of this progress. But this, dear friends, is not the time to slacken in our efforts. 
As co-chair of the Working Group on Stabilization, together with my Emirati friends, I must emphasize that we should continue to make every effort so as to maintain the momentum of the stabilization process. Money will always be short, but we need to be prepared with a view to the significant challenges lying ahead, in particular the liberation of Mosul. Now is the time to ensure for funding for our humanitarian work as well as for our stabilization efforts. From this endeavor, I have drawn two main lessons. They will guide German commitments to our continuous engagement in Iraq. Lesson one, we need to make a difference in the life of ordinary Iraqis. We must alleviate their plight during the displacement. We must allow refugees a dignified return to their home cities. Therefore, Germany is pledging an additional 176 million US dollar for 2016 and 17 in support of Iraq. This will bring the current total civilian assistance of the German government in 2016 and 17 to more than 517 million US dollar. This year, Germany will contribute additional 55 million US dollar for immediate stabilization, additional 16.5 million US dollar for the clearance of explosive devices and additional 5.5 million US dollar for the UN humanitarian response plan for Fallujah. Lesson two, Fallujah taught us that we must be earlier in our response. Today's fresh appeal of Mosul is a case in point. For this reason, I decided today to contribute additional 10 million euro uh, meaning uh, 11 million U.S. dollar in humanitarian aid to prepare for the liberation of Mosul, especially in the field of health. Early support counts double. Early in response also means thinking ahead. For next year, we will provide a minimum of 66 million U.S. dollar for humanitarian aid and 22 million U.S. dollar for stabilization efforts. And we are also committed to support our Iraqi partners beyond the stabilization and crisis models of Burundi. My government will make Iraq a partner country in our development cooperation programs for, from uh, 2017 on. So at the end of this year, we expect to be able to announce a significant additional contribution for 2017, which must be negotiated between the German and Iraqi authorities. Colleagues, as important as all of our contributions are, a stable Iraq will only develop if all Iraqis, government, people, and security forces work together towards building a united and inclusive Iraq. We appeal to our Iraqi partners to further strengthen their efforts to reach a consensus on the political issues that divide the Iraqi nation. Our support is given gladly but it will only be effective if accompanied by continued reconciliation and political reform. I wish to thank once more our host, John Kerry. My thanks also include Special Presidential Envoy Brett McGurk and his team, as well as my other co-host partners for all the work they have done. I'm confident that today's conference will reach its targets in providing more than two, million, two billion U.S. dollar in support of Iraq and in advance would like to thank everyone present here today for their generous contributions. My thanks would be therefore not be complete without, without mentioning those countries in the region that are hosting and assisting millions of refugees. Their contributions are invaluable and our message today also is that these partners need our continued support too. Many thanks. Frank, thank you very, very much. Very significant in Germany's, uh, not just your contributions, but your persistent uh, prodding and leadership in this is welcomed by everybody, and we're very, very grateful to you. I now recognize uh, the State Minister for Foreign Affairs of Japan, Yoji Muto. I will speak Japanese. Mr. Jafari and my 
co-hosts and distinguished ministers of co-chair companies, countries and representatives of participant countries and organizations, Secretary Kerry. I would, on behalf of the government of Japan, I should like to first of all express my gratitude to Secretary Kerry and the government of the United States for taking the initiative on this conference. It is my great pleasure to attend this conference. Now, the future of the international community is overshadowed by terrorism, which is prevalent across the world, and humanitarian crises of the vast number of refugees and IDPs. Despite such problems, arduous efforts are being made in Iraq to move forward. In this sense, Iraq is a country that stands on the front line for addressing the most serious problems the international community is tackling and I am convinced that it is of great significance that we are gathered here today. Iraq is, however, not able to continue working so hard indefinitely, and we, the international community, must support the people and the government of Iraq in order not to lose our momentum. There are in Iraq about 3.4 million IDPs and about 250,000 refugees from Syria. The stock of supplies and preparation are not satisfactory, and it is speculated that there will be a further rise in the number of IDPs and refugees. Providing humanitarian assistance to save their lives is an immediate task, especially given that the temperature there reaches around 50 degrees Celsius. Moreover, it is, it is significant to swiftly implement assistance to protect the IDPs and to facilitate their return and resettlement so that we can ensure the areas that have been liberated at enormous sacrifice will never fall into the hands of terrorists again. In this regard, the assistance that is being implemented in Iraq under FFIS should be appreciated as it has opened up a new form of assistance that can amplify the effectiveness of economic assistance under the situation marked by the fight against terrorism. In March of this year, Japan provided 100 million U.S. dollars for humanitarian and stabilization assistance through international organizations, including $16 million for FFIS. On this occasion, Japan has decided to provide yet another $10 million for FFIS and humanitarian response program to deal with the ongoing serious humanitarian crisis in Iraq. Furthermore, with the recognition that seamless assistance to Iraq is vital to the stabilization of Iraq, I am very happy to announce that Japan intends to maintain this level of assistance in the year 2017 and 2018. In the G7 Isashima summit in this, this May, Japan, as the president of the G7 this year, has successfully mobilized commitments of the total amount of 3.6 billion U.S. dollars from the G7 members. With Japan will provide a fiscal support of 500 million U.S. dollars to the government of Iraq. Also, the G7 expressed its view that it is important to ensure that those fiscal support, that such fiscal support should benefit all of the Iraq people, including the Kurds. Japan takes seriously the importance of this assistance to Iraq. This is not only because the stability in Iraq is directly linked with the stability of the Middle East as a whole, but also because Japan, as one of the major donors with, an, with affluent uh, population, is determined to support the fight against terrorism and to actively engage with significant issues for the international community. I sincerely hope that the assistance pledge at this conference will be used effectively and contribute to peace and stability in Iraq. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister, and we thank Japan for its very steady uh, commitment and for the commitment out into the future. Um, now my pleasure to uh, recognize the Kuwaiti Assistant Secretary for follow-up and coordination, Nasser al Sabi. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. At the outset, I would like to thank the host country for organizing this uh, uh, forum and for inviting Kuwait to be part of this uh, humanitarian manifestation and support. Again, I would like to support the co-chairs to invite Kuwait to co-host this uh, meeting. Mr. Chairman, 
Iraq is going through a tragic humanitarian situation, an economic situation, uh, forces us all, the international community, to help each based on their own resources to stand by the people of Iraq and try to relieve its burden. Kuwait will never leave an effort in order to support the stability of Iraq. Kuwait also realizes the difficult economic circumstances of uh, Iraq, and as such, we did uh, waive the compensation that was 4.6 billion uh, U.S. dollars for the third year, and that is to support, to relieve the humanitarian burden for our brothers in Iraq. Both Kuwait and Iraq coordinate bilaterally consistently in what achieves the cooperation operation and the uh, interoperability of their institutions at the development and financial level to support the economic, financial and development um, uh, scene in Iraq. Also, because we support Iraq and to make sure that this meeting is a success and based on a clear order of His Highness Emir Subah, God bless him, Kuwait wants to give 100 million U.S. dollars to support the health section and rehabilitate the health hospitals and medical institutions of Iraq with, with a supervision of the relevant Kuwaiti institutions. Also to provide $30 million for the relief that also Kuwait undertakes in coordination with the Iraqi government and the UN to respond to the needs. Also in this context, we have also allocated 46 million U.S. dollars within the plan for fast and swift response to uh, help in the humanitarian relief based on the recent developments in Al Fallujah. Also, while we coordinate with the brothers in Iraq, we will hold a meeting between Kuwait and Iraq this current month to clarify the mechanism to support Iraq and to have a collective GCC support for Iraq as well as the uh, countries of the world. I, we ask God that this meeting be successful and for Iraq to see stability, prosperity and peace very soon to become again a constructive partner in the stability and peace around the world, and thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Secretary, and I hope you will extend uh, our broad gratitude to the Emir uh, for uh, Kuwait's presence and for its leadership on this. And I know as a near neighbor, you obviously are enormously impacted by this. So I think the several, the health section is very important, the relief and the humanitarian, and it, adds up to a significant contribution, so thank you very much. I now recognize the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs for Netherlands, Mr. Bert Kunders. Thank you very much, uh, John, and uh, thank you and Samantha for the generosity of our uh, hosts today and the efforts of our fellow co-hosts, Canada, Germany, uh, Kuwait, and Japan. I think this uh, pledging conference is extremely time timely. In incredibly important if we look to the massive challenge we have in front of us. And I think the liberation of Fallujah resulting in uh, many IDPs fleeing the town illustrated that stepping up international support for Iraq is uh, much needed. Uh, I recognize also the colleague, my colleague from uh, Iraq and I wanted to thank you also for the enormous actions that the Iraqi security forces are uh, doing in expelling Daesh from so many places in Iraq. Uh, at the same time, Terrorist attacks that have recently taken place across Baghdad, even across the world, stress the fact that we are nowhere near the total defeat of Daesh. It's an octopus, it's a snake with many heads. And therefore, when we are dealing uh, with this enemy uh, and the way we deal with the proper military engagement in the future weeks and months, we have to include the, the issue of proper planning of the humanitarian and the political side. I think that is very, very important. Daesh thrives on instability and regional sectorism, uh, so this enemy cannot be defeated by military means alone. I think that's the crucial message for today. And it's also how we make a link between the military planning, the civilian planning, and the proper humanitarian efforts in a way that can lead to inclusiveness. I think many people in um, uh, Iraq at the moment feel deeply traumatized, humiliated. They're the object of bad governance through Daesh and other uh, actors. 
that we need to create a local confidence with the government of Iraq to ensure that the humanitarian efforts are integrated in the planning uh, of the actions that we will have to do in the next uh, couple of weeks. And therefore, I think this civilian military cooperation and coordination, we'll talk about it, I'm sure, tomorrow, will partly decide to what extent our large humanitarian efforts will be successful. One of the immediate challenges we face in our fight against uh, ISIS is the liberation of Mosul. Everybody has mentioned this, with over one and a half million citizens, uh, the largest city under Daesh occupancy. I think this will be an enormous challenge for all of us. Uh, and the Iraqi government, most of all. And I think we must le learn from the previous experiences. We know that almost the entire remaining population will attempt to flee uh, as soon as military operations start, requiring early, and that is not, we are not good at this, frankly. Uh, we need very early um, um, uh, humanitarian actions already in the planning, integrated uh, with massive humanitarian preparation for the reception of so many in dire need of food, medical aid, and a safe haven. I want to comment on the great work of the United Nations and others here present uh, when uh, we were dealing with the situation in Tikrit. We also learned that when military operations are concluded, most will want to return as soon as possible, while Daesh will have left the whole city booby-trapped. And people must be urged not to return before mine assessments. That's why this money for mine assessment is so important have been made and most urgent clearing has been done. At the same time, we have to continue this whole issue of mine, mine awareness and so on and so forth. I think also when we are planning in the humanitarian area of immediate projects and programs, but also in the medium and long term, that's why there are these two trust funds of the UNDP, uh, we learned that reconciliation at local level right from the start is of utmost importance. Every citizen should feel safe to return and be allowed to return under the same conditions because if we don't think that through, the seeds for a new dash will be planted. And this process obviously must be led by the Iraqi government, uh, Iraqi civil society, uh, and the international community in service of that. Only if inclusiveness and reconciliation form an integrated part of humanitarian stabilization and governance efforts, we can achieve long-term stability in post dash territory. And therefore, I think it is important that in, in the coming weeks, Humanitarian actors uh, are given proper warning of operations, meaning uh, no lack in response to IDPs, that cities declared liberated and IDPs encouraged to return before the city has been secured. This is very, very uh, important uh, and very complex, especially when the campaigns uh, move towards the Nineveh. In the end, it is key that we all step up in a time that there are so many humanitarian challenges for all of us. We know that many humanitarian appeals are simply not filled. I would like to say that it's very, very crucial. Therefore, uh, John, and I appreciate uh, that you have organized this right now, because we have to plan it right now if the humanitarian and development efforts are keeping pace with what is happening in the mil military arena. The Dutch government has been uh, engaged in this uh, for many years uh, as, as a big donor. Today, we all gathered here to scale up our efforts to meet the needs in Iraq, the Netherlands, uh, contribu will contribute in uh, 2016 only uh, uh, 65 million for stabilization, demining, humanitarian aid and training of security forces in Iraq. Immediate stabilization after liberation of a town is crucial as we have successfully seen in Tikrit. That's why uh, this needs to be done in line with what I said, longer term reforms and uh, making sure that there is no democratic, uh, de demographic engineering. We support this important work of the United Nations with 25 million via the FFIS and FFES, immediate and expanded stabilization. In order to stabilize a region and in order to ensure safe return of the population, it is of the utmost importance that IEDs and explosives are being cleared and the populations receive mine awareness uh, training. This is why today the Netherlands will start a new four-year humanitarian demining program of 45 million euros. Uh, of which a substantial part will go to Iraq. Then we will support a humanitarian response in Iraq with uh, 11 million. Uh, but funds are not the only uh, issue for an effective uh, response. As I said, coordination and building a local capacity is important. That's why we are engaged in this, and obviously also in the work that deals with the military training for the Iraqi security forces and Peshmergas in non-lethal assistance for clearing IEDs and explosive remnants. Uh, in 2016, we allocated 19 million of these uh, efforts. 
The Netherlands will continue to support these important efforts for a stable Iraq in the years to come. We hope and expect also that our Iraqi colleagues uh, continue to take the lead in ensuring that our current, current joint efforts will contribute to a more stable, inclusive, and prosperous uh, future for the people of Iraq. Thank you. Uh, Bert, thank you very much. And with your pledge, your important uh, broad pledge of several different areas, uh, we're well over half a billion uh, already, which is a good start towards our goal. It's more than a good start. It's a terrific start towards our goal. Let me add to that, if I can now, as the last of the uh, co-hosts to open up with our pledges, and then we open it up to everybody. The EU will follow me immediately. Um, uh, we will provide, and, uh, and I've gone through enough sort of talking about the, and everybody is, I think, well advocated for what we're doing here, so let me cut with all of that and just go directly to what we're going to do here. Uh, we're going to provide an additional 130 million, there are tranches here that I'm going to talk about, 130 million in humanitarian assistance to try to close the gap in demand for immediate emergency aid and food, medicine, shelter. Second, we will make available 45 million in new money to expand the humanitarian mine action program in Iraq, which is obviously a key element of our security recovery, uh, rebuilding uh, of liberated areas initiative. Um, and uh, apparently, so, you know, some 6,000 buildings in Ramadi were destroyed utterly or seriously damaged. The entire electrical grid and water supply was not functioning. Bridges were down, the school system was in disrepair, uh, and recovery efforts could not fully get underway until the mines were cleared and explosives were removed. And despite all the precautions that were taken, and believe me, they were taken, uh, several hundred Ramadi residents have been killed by IEDs, as I mentioned earlier. So that's a major initiative. Third, the United States will provide an additional 85 million for immediate stabilization and recovery activities, about three-quarters of which will be allocated directly to the UNDP's uh, funding facility for that purpose. And then finally, uh, we will join with other seed investors in launching the UNDP funding facility for expanded stabilization. Our contribution to this vital new initiative will initially be $50 million to insist in fostering longer-term recovery in, uh, in uh, Dayala, Saladin, Nineveh, and Ambar provinces. So the total U.S. pledge uh, covering the remainder of this fiscal year, for those of you for whom the morning is uh, too early to do your math, uh, it's $310 million. Uh, and uh, we are committed to making certain at the same time we will continue to do all that we are doing on the kinetic side to help our friends in Iraq to be able to prosecute the uh, mission against Mosul and take a major step in the full liberation of Iraq and, frankly, the full defeat of uh, Daesh. So those are the heart of the thing I'm going to cut the rest of the comments that I've made because I think I have made them. And now uh, I would like to uh, invite our colleague from the European Commission, uh, uh, Christos Stalianis, to introduce the joint pledge on behalf of the EU and the European Commission. Thank you so much, uh, Secretary Kerry. Dear Excellencies, dear friends, first of all, I would like to thank Secretary Kerry USA and, of course, Germany, Canada, Japan, the Netherlands, and Kuwait for hosting this important event extremely timely. Lisa Grande has already given us the alarming figures of the humanitarian tragedy on the ground. And uh, now we have the real assessment on the ground. And, uh, I would like to commend the exceptional work of OCHA, 
together with the ICRC and all our partners on the ground for their outstanding job. In my last two visits to the country, I witnessed on the ground the impact of this catastrophe. I will return very soon, next week. Iraq stands now at a critical juncture. Additional 2.5 million people could be displaced by the end of the year, a result of the conflict in Anbar and towards Mosul. We must put the protection of civilians and civilian infrastructures first, ensuring respect of international humanitarian law during and after the conduct of hostilities. We must learn from the positive efforts made in Fallujah and replicate them in Mosul. We can make the difference in Iraq. Daesh can and will be defeated on the battlefield, but we will succeed in defending the poison of violence on the ideological battleground only if we also find hatred and division and work together to preserve dignity and reconciliation for all communities. This starts with ensuring principles, life-saving humanitarian aid for all civilians most in need, whoever and wherever they are. We must be prepared and respond to current and massive needs to come. It's our collective moral responsibility for Iraq and our collective interest for the stability of the whole region and beyond. This also includes ensuring an effective aid continuum from humanitarian aid to stabilization and development support crucial for the safe, voluntary, dignified and sustainable return of displaced population. We must make sure that civilian efforts in the liberated areas will keep pace with the military success. All the above is an indispensable prerequisite for preserving human life and reducing human suffering in this conflict, and also a fundamental political cornerstone for reconciliation and the future stability and prosperity of the country. We praise the efforts of the Iraqi leadership. They can count on our relentless support, and we count on their commitment to offer a future to all Iraqis. The European Union stands in solidarity with all Iraqi people and will continue to stand at the forefront of international aid efforts. I'm honored to announce today additional 194 million euros, 215 US aid dollars for Iraq in EU support. This includes humanitarian, stabilization, and development support. We can succeed, but we must do more now and effectively and together. This conference, it is a starting point, is not the end of our collective action. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, and, and I'm pleased to tell you that takes us well over with the amount that we put in, and together with the EU, uh, I haven't completed all the math, but I think it's somewhere around 1.2 billion, so we are climbing. And now we give the Kingdom of Norway the opportunity to take us even further. Barger Brenda. Thank you, uh, Secretary uh, Kerry, thank you. John, thank you uh, to the U.S. Uh, for convening this uh, budget conference in support of Iraq. Thank you also to colleagues from Kuwait, Germany, Canada, Japan, and the Netherlands for being co-conveners. And also thank you to my colleague from um, Iraq for your uh, leadership. The monstrous attacks in Baghdad and Nis are brutal reminders of the constant threat that terrorism and violent extremism represent to us all. While our thoughts go to the numerous victims and their loved ones, 
we must also act. Act in order to step up our fight against ISIL and act in order to relieve the human suffering that they cause. As you know, Norway took the initiative and co-hosted the London Conference in February, where 12 billion was raised to meet the needs of the Syrian people. This was unprecedented, but the challenge we faced was also unprecedented. Norway pledged 280 million US dollars for 2016 and 1.16 billion dollars for the next four years. For Iraq, Norway has already allocated 275 million kroner for 2016, the equivalent of almost 35 million US dollars. Today, I'm announcing that Norway will increase its support to Iraq with an additional 50 million uh, Norwegian kroner. This brings our total support to Iraq close to $40 million this year. The bulk of the funding is humanitarian. I'm also pleased to already know, announce that in 2017, we will double our contribution for stabilization efforts in both Syria and Iraq and pledge Norwegian 200 million kroner or almost 25 million US dollars for each country. This is on top of what we do um, in the humanitarian field and as I referred to also from um, the Syria conference. The fight against ISIL is of historic importance and we will have made the world a safer place once we have succeeded, and 40% of the territory is now retaken in Iraq, and we need to be there with stabilization funding, and we need to make sure that people that have been under a brutal uh, situation of having been controlled of ISIL have to feel that they will see a better life when they're freed from this brutal terrorist organization, and that's why this conference is so important. Again, thank you, John, for your leadership and for the U.S in convening this conference. Thank you. Well, Borger, let me say, and I think I say this on behalf of everybody, whenever there's a conference, Norway is there. Uh, I don't think any small country in the world gives quite as much as Norway in both leadership and funding, and so we're very, very appreciative for your presence here today and for all that you do. Um, I now recognize the Minister of Foreign Affairs for the Czech Republic, His Excellency Lumia Zoralik. Thank you, John. Your Excellencies, first of all, I have also have to thank, thank to the host governments uh, for convening this conference, but at the same time I have to commend also the efforts of all actors involved into the liberation, stabilization and protection in Iraq, including the humanitarian field actors and I have to comment also all this tireless effort in favor of the conflict affected citizens, internally displaced persons and refugees in Iraq. I have also to say that I'm convinced that all what we can do now for Iraq is the same what we have to do for us, we, can, we have to do for us because now in these days it's clear that it's not enough to speak and concentrate on our resi resilience only, but we have to be able also to show our ability to uh, shape our security environment. And we have to show capability to shape events in our neighborhood. And what we see now in Iraq and Syria, it's uh, uh, something uh, which may be very intricate and serious. And despite our efforts, the crisis in Iraq, as well as in Syria, continue to be unprecedented in scale, nature and consequences both for the people in the two affected countries, their regional neighborhood and the international community. And we have to be very deeply concerned by the scale of devastation and repeated forced displacement in both countries. It's absolutely clear that all this is not only about concrete fight with Daesh, but at the same time we have to concentrate on stabilization of places which have been liberated. 
and Czech Republic is participating in the Stabilization and Reconstruction Group for Iraq. And while, while participating in this group, we are also participating in the humanitarian and development-related assistance to the affected people and their hosting communities with a particular focus on health care protection and education. We also support the UNDP funding facility for immediate stabilization and welcome the establishment of a new founding channel for expanded stabilization under the same umbrella. We also, also supported the expanding of the EU Trust Fund for Syria to Iraq with the focus on the rehabilitation of key infrastructure and on the support of sustainable livelihoods for internally displaced persons and refugees, as well as for their host communities. We are fully aware that only a political solution which with a broad nationwide and international support can end the current human, human suffering in Iraq and the region. And we are ready to support it, not least through our continued participation in the anti-ISIL coalition and its stabilization group. In view of the urgent stabilization needs in Iraq, the Czech Republic commitment for 2016 and onwards is to keep its assistance, at least on the current level, with a fresh pledge of additional million US dollar for 2016, which includes a contribution to the FIS and to the UNHCR appeal for the internally displaced camps. Thank you for attention. Thank you very much. We appreciate uh, the contribution and now uh, I recognize uh, we're jumping around a little bit here for various reasons, but I will recognize uh, Belgian Foreign Minister Armand de Decker. Uh, thank you, Secretary of State, uh, Excellencies. Uh, Mr. de Decker is still in, on, uh, on his way to, uh, to Washington. He will arrive hopefully in time for, for lunch. Uh, I'm the uh, counterterrorism ambassador at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And I will continue in, uh, in French language. Um, the coalition should be proud of the substantial military progress it has made, as well as uh, all that it has done and humanitarily. I would like to commend the Iraqi government uh, for its efforts in this regard. Belgium shares the opinion that it is through progressive, re, uh, uh, progressive uh, regaining of control of these areas that we need to be sure that those living on the ground, living in these communities, in these areas, are sure of the safety, of their safety. The members of the coalition should be sure that civilian and military operations be as coordinated as possible. If we are not coordinated, this could cause substantial gaps and could lead to a resurgence of Daesh's influence and to further instability in the region. That refugees and IDPs can return safely, that should also be one of our priorities. That will diminish feelings of revenge and will calm, help calm the local populations. Belgium is committed to contributing to the support, humanitarian support in particular, in addition to the tens of millions of dollars in support that we pledged last year for refugees in Syria and Iraq, and that is in addition also to Belgians, Belgium's contributions to the UNHCR programs, among others, and the World Food Program. The Belgian government, in addition to all of this, has decided to grant 2 million euros for the FFIS. We also plan to pledge additional funds for the demining initiatives. Thank you.
Thank you very much. L let me, um, as I introduce uh, our next speaker, who is the ambassador of the Kingdom of Sweden to the United States, is actually Bjorn Olaf Jervall. Let me just say to everybody that I need to ask my co-hosts to step out with me in a moment because uh, we need to meet with some folks in order to explain what we are doing here today. Uh, and then I need to make my uh, apologies to everybody because I have to meet when I am in the country one-on-one, uh, -on -one, I meet each week with my boss. And uh, I'm only here for a day and a half today, and my boss has told me when I'm meeting with him. And as all of you know, that's when you're going to be there. So I need to step out because I go directly from there to the White House to meet, but then I'll be back. Uh, we are currently, as we judge it, at uh, uh, about 1.25 billion as of now and climbing. Uh, our able permanent uh, representative to the United Nations is also, uh, as I think many of you know, a member of the President's Cabinet. And she is going to continue to chair along with Brett McGurk in my absence. But I again want to thank, uh, profoundly thank everybody for what we are doing here today. And we're going to be meeting. Almost everybody here will be meeting in the course of today and tomorrow. Tomorrow we have a long day focused on uh, Dash ISIL with a, a lot of input, and I think it's going to be extremely productive. So without further ado, Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much for, for your contribution and your role. And I will turn the chair over to uh, Ambassador Power.